Julian Jones, Vice Principal of the University, to come and listen to a professor perplex. It reminds me what the purpose of the university is. I feel a little inadequate on this occasion. I'm a, I'm a physicist, and you know, physicists are not by their nature uh, particularly communicators. <laughs> um, we are never happier than when we are standing at the whiteboard and filling it with incomprehensible symbols. Um, <laughs> which you'll be pleased to hear I'm not intending to be. Um, Instead, uh, what I'm going to do is offer a few probably rather inadequate uh, uh, words of introduction uh, to someone who, unlike me, is a professional communicator. I must say, I'm looking forward to it. One of the great pleasures of my job, and actually a pleasure which is open to all of you, which is to attend these lectures. And something that you can't help be struck by is that although we are a relatively small university and a relatively applied university, what an extraordinary range of different professional talents that we have. But because we are a relatively small university, we know one another rather well. I don't know about you, but I feel that nowadays there are very, very few really important problems facing society out there which admit of my disciplinary solutions. Consequently, having the sort of diversity that we have and the scale that we have, this is in a particularly good position to tackle those sort of problems. Now you're going to hear a little bit about that uh, this evening. Professor Napier's research interests are diverse, but they all really revolve around the idea of language and communication in the context of language interpreting and in particular the deaf community. I had a real privilege, actually, just, just a month or two ago. One of the things I, I particularly enjoy in my uh, job is the chance to interview prospective new members of staff. But on this particular occasion, I had the opportunity of interviewing some candidates uh, through the medium of British Sign Language. I'd never done that before. And the most striking thing was the extraordinary complexity of the communication that could be managed through that medium. I should have realised that I never did. There's nothing like doing a thing for yourself to learn something about it. Which I guess leads me to my final point here, because <coughs> in mind, as well as being a researcher and an educator, you actually go and do this thing. And I think that makes a great difference. Jemima is an interpreter practitioner, and I'm sure that gives you a much more insight and competence. I think it's time that I stopped and sat down and listened to some hosting professional practice. Jemima, you're all yours. Thank you, Julie. Thank you for that introduction. My name is Jermaine Napier. And I decided to start my presentation tonight in my first language, my mother tongue, British Sign Language. And my parents are both here tonight. Thanks to both of them for coming. And also, my mother and father in law are also here. They're also both deaf sign language users, so thanks to them for being here. My daughter is in the front row, Tilda. She's hearing, but she is fluent in sign language as well. And I have to say hello to my husband as well, Andy. Unfortunately, he's laid up in bed. He's hurt his back at the moment, so he can't be here tonight. He can't walk, he can't move, so I hope he's watching online on the live stream. You'll see there the hashtag is signposting, all one word. So if you do want to tweet about tonight's event or send that out on social media, that would be the hashtag you would use. Now, if you do want to use the online Wi-Fi here is KeySurf that you would need to use. EduRoom is actually for students of the, the university, so guests can log into the Wi-Fi that's titled KeySurf. Okay. 
Now I'd like to start off just kind of going through some of the common misperceptions about what people think sign language is. A lot of people are very surprised to realise that there isn't one universal sign language. And people often comment, oh, well, why isn't there? There should be. That would be easier. It would be much easier for deaf people if we had one sign language all over the world. And my response is usually, okay, well, in spoken languages, we have lots of different spoken languages. What about here tonight? We have Spanish. Mm -hmm. Spanish in the room, please raise your hand. French speakers here. We have some French. German speakers, I believe. We have some Germans in. Any others? We have Italian. Irish. Irish. <laughs> we have Irish. So what if we said, oh, we should just have one language for all over the world. It would be much easier for everyone. Which one do we pick? And it's the same idea for sign language. People often assume that sign language matches exactly English and that it's just English on the hands. And it's not. Sign language has its own distinct grammar, its own structure, its own vocabulary. And part of my job is to work between those two languages as an interpreter. I work between those two languages and two different cultures. So it's the same between a spoken language to a sign language or a spoken language to a spoken language. The same interpreting issues arise. And when we're considering the world, you know nowadays we're becoming much more of a multilingual and a global community. So multilingualism is a very important part of that globalisation of society nowadays. And that includes that wide diversity of spoken and sign languages. So if you're talking about multilingualism, sign languages would absolutely be part of that discussion. Now when we consider intercultural communication, that's a perspective when we consider two people who come together to engage in conversation. They may even have the same language, but they may not share a culture. If you have a British person and an American person, they may both speak English, but there can still be clashes of culture and cultural communication breakdowns because of those different cultural backgrounds. <coughs> so when you have different cultures as well as different languages, then you're mediating between these two mediums. <coughs> and my interest is in that area of intercultural communication where these two things come together. And obviously within that communication paradigm, interpreting studies is my field of interest. How that communication happens between those two languages and between those two cultures. So the broad theme of interpreting studies is a discipline that looks at spoken and sign language and interpreting between those two languages. In the past, we did see more of a, 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 a divergence between spoken languages and sign languages, but now through research, we're realising that much of the same issues occur within both mediums. So we're able to share research between the two and see how many of these issues do in fact overlap. And my research draws on both intercultural communication and interpreting studies. So I would say I have four main broad research interests, as you'll see on the PowerPoint here. Sign language interpreting, applied sign linguistics as well. I'll say more about all of these areas as I go through. Interpreter pedagogy. So I'm interested in how we teach people to become interpreters. And the other area there is language brokering. And it, it is like interpreting a way, but there's more to it. It's not just interpreting. And again, I'll go into that in more depth as we go through the presentation. So at the moment, these are my four areas of research interest. Now, you all seen the title for my, for my presentation, <coughs> and there's an image of a signpost there. So how did I get to where I am today? Professor? Me? Lecturing? I can't believe it. You know, ask my mum when I was small, if you said to her then, in the future, what will Jemina become a professor? If you said professor, she'd be like, oh, no way. Jemina? No, not at all. And yet here I am. So it is possible. Anyone can become a professor. <laughs> so for me, 
I'll tell you a little bit about my background. This was a rough drawing I did of my family tree. So as I said, I have deaf parents, but actually I come from a family with four generations of deaf people. So at the top, the two people would be my great grandparents, who both prefer the deaf, my grandmother and her two sisters, and my grandfather and his sister, then my parents. My mum has a sister who's deaf. <coughs> and also I have a deaf cousin. And then down to me. Here. <laughs> so it's not just that I had deaf parents, it's that I could do come from that intergenerational deaf. You know, and I was the one hearing person, I was a strange one. Myself and my brother were both hearing from a very large deaf family. But everyone in my family who's hearing are able to sing. And that was normal for me growing up because we had so many deaf members in our family. And the first language of our home was BSL, British Sign Language, and English, by the way. <coughs> because obviously I went to school, I learned English for six years. I then learned Spanish for two years. Most of that's gone, I'll never have a few words of my Spanish left, but I did learn that at the time. Then I moved to Australia and learned Auslan. Australian Sign Language, Auslan. And then, you know, with attending conferences and research work in America, I've also learned ASL, American Sign Language. And I've said here a smattering of other languages. Like a little bit, I have the odd word. I know how to say hello, goodbye, thank you, and cheers <laughs> in a few other languages. About 20 different languages, I have those basic ones. And my Chinese teacher is here, I've sitting up there as well. I'm trying to learn a little bit of Chinese at the moment, and I'm not very good, am I? So as you'll see, I would consider myself multilingual. What's interesting is when I meet other people and say, oh, I'm an interpreter, I'm bilingual, and they go, oh, how many languages do you speak? People always ask that. And I say, well, sign languages, hmm, this many. Spoken languages, English, and another couple. But sign languages are my preference, that's where I'm stronger. And for me, I would really say that, you know, I have that multi safety identity. Because growing up, I was hearing. I used sign language. And now I'm a mother. I'm also a doctor. I'm an interpreter. I'm a professor. And all of these different identities feed into who I am. <coughs> but they all relate to whatever language I'm using. So that language used to really influence my identity and where I am now. And I would say during my life, even now that it continues within my work, I would say that I have intercultural communication embedded within my brain and still now in my work, within everything. And I think that's absolutely why I'm drawn to research in that area. And I'll tell you more about you know, where I've come from and how I feel that that's that brought me to where I am now. So I was thinking about what would be the best way to describe my journey. And I thought if I highlight some of my milestones, then that might help you to understand from my professional life how I've arrived at where I am. And often from how one thing was the starter for research interest in that area or other factors. So each milestone links to the research in my area. So it's a way of explaining my research, but also explaining my personal background. You see the first bullet point there on the slide, the sign language interpreter. And my first paid job as a sign language interpreter was when I was 17. And my students, you should not be doing this, you should not But looking back at that time, I think, wow, I was 17. And I remember first going into court, I was 19. Headed in, did my interpreting, you know, I was as nervous as they were probably. And I look back now, I think, oh, I'm 19 in court. But things were different then. We didn't have, you know, university courses for interpreters. There were professionalisation of interpreters was just beginning. You know, there wasn't a lot of professional interpreters. Things were new and emerging, and I was there at the start of it. So that was new for everyone. <clears throat> but at the time, a lot of people said, oh, you're bilingual, you should be an interpreter. You <coughs> you've got English, you do that. And I was like, oh, OK, I'll go do that. Be the temperature. 
So I want to show you a few different examples of the different areas I've worked in. So from medical, TV, legal, community, mental health, <coughs> and I'll just show you some clips to give you some examples. <laughs> It's from VHS. President Yeltsin has come into a Moscow hospital to have his long awaited heart bypass operation. Surgery began three hours ago. Heart has been transferred to the Russian Prime Minister of the Victor Germany. Did you see my lovely red hair in that clip? Mm -hmm. I think it was about 22 then. So 20 years ago, when I was interpreting on TV. So another instance where I've still had red hair, you'll see me there. See me with a white collar? Oh, I have a pointer. That's me there. And this was at Princess Diana's funeral. I was actually there with my husband and he's next to me. We were both there as sign language temperatures. He's a sign language temperature too. Hi, Andy. <laughs> And we were both there because Princess Diana at that time um, was actually a patron of the British Deaf Association, the BDA, um, when she tragically died. So there were people from the British Deaf Association, deaf people, who were actually on the other side of us, um, six or seven um, deaf delegates who were there. So we were invited as interpreters to interpret through the funeral. And you'll also see here, this is the opera singer, Pavarotti. Yeah. <laughs> That's him right there. <laughs> and I can tell you right through the funeral, he was in floods of tears, really emotional, really <laughs> all through the funeral. And I'm trying to interpret it, but I was it. <laughs> it's a little bit distracting. But that was definitely a demand for that attention when you're interpreting funerals and someone's crying very loudly next to you. But we felt we were privileged to be involved and to be able to interpret in that situation. So I've been lucky that I've had the opportunity to interpret at fairly prestigious and important events for deaf people in the deaf community's lives. So this was in Australia for the Australian Prime Minister. I've got one Australian friend here, and um, this is for you. As you know, people who have been to many labour conferences in the past, it is not normal for a Prime Minister to come onto the conference floor and move a resolution. But I've chosen to do that today for the National Disability Insurance Scheme because of the importance to this for our country, because of the value we place on the Australians who have joined us today and the two million other Australians that That looks more like me, doesn't it? That's more recognisable to me. <coughs> so again, privileged to be interpreting next to the Australian Prime Minister at that time. It was related to funding for people with disabilities. So again, very important event and prestigious for the deaf community. You know, and so I had a lot of wonderful experiences thanks to my skills as an interpreter. But again, due to my bilingual upbringing, you know, that multilingualism, that multiculturalism allowed me those opportunities and also allowed deaf people to improve within their lives by having these opportunities available in temporary form. What's interesting though is obviously I work as an interpreter, but when you trace things back to where that started from, why I began that kind of work. If you were to ask my mum again, you know, would she become a professor? No chance. But if you look to other examples, there is evidence there that you could have predicted potentially what I'd want to, to do in the future. That's me. <laughs> was that eight? Mum, oh, was that right? I was eight there. And if you go through the pages, you'll see pictures of my mum, my dad, my brother. We're all signing all these frozen pictures of signing. <laughs> and I feel like that book, when you look at the things I was signing, I was eight. I can't believe, you know, when I look back. And it was prophetic. I think when you look at, I'll show you some of the signs that I was signing. And it was prophetic in predicting what I'd be doing in the future. There's no sound on this video.
So that video clip is actually my mum and I. I was 10 and it was in London. Right, right next to Trafalgar Square, there was a big rally at that time uh, to recognise British Sign Language as an official language. Um, hundreds and thousands of deaf people there. So mum said, okay, come on up to the front. So there was me in front of the camera signing to my mum, signing like this, looking to the audience. And it was a huge audience in Trafalgar Square. And I think, wow, at 10, I was doing that. Again, that was like, tick, you know, there's public speaker. happy to be up on stage and present in front of lots of people because I was at started at 10, so. So I was working as an interpreter. Then I began teaching, a little bit of teaching, interpreter training courses. It was in the book. <laughs> Photo eight of me signing teach, teaching. Who knew? <laughs> So I started a lot of teaching and interpreting, but I felt that with my teaching and my interpreting, because I'd started interpreting just from my experience, I hadn't had formal training, because there wasn't formal training available then. And, but when there was an, a master's degree set up at Durham University for sign language interpreting, Graham was involved at that time, Professor Turner. Um, so I arrived as a student, Graham was just left as a student, so he didn't teach me, unfortunately. Um, I arrived at Durham and studied the MA in, in sign language interpreting. And once I'd got the ME, I understood far more about interpreting, having done that research. And that's when I really discovered linguistics and research. And that really helped me to understand what I was doing in interpreting, you know, and really understand the complexities, the challenges, and, and help me realise what it was that I loved about interpreting. So really from that research made me want to find out more and look more at interpreting and linguistics. And again, from the book, Australia. And that's the old saying for Australia. People use a different sign there for Australia. Is that right, Australia? <laughs> so then people do this, like, tick, tick, and dump. You know, like, all the convicts were sent over there to Australia. So it's, it's just Australia. It's not as big as that. So that's because at that time, I moved to Australia to study a PhD in linguistics. I got a Commonwealth scholarship that allowed me to go to, to university and study a PhD. It should have been for three years to complete the PhD, to become a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Again, this book, I'm telling you, there was so much there, but obviously it wasn't a medical doctor. That's the sign for a medical doctor. I was studying for a doctorate um, in Australia. So as I say, it should have been a three-year um, stay, but I actually ended up staying there for 15 years. And hearing people, you know, when you meet me, you're probably not be able to work out my accent. <coughs> there's a little bit of London there, because I grew up in London. And then there's a little bit of Australian there, now I'm back and I'm in Scotland, so people sometimes find that accent hard to place. Okay, I'm going to switch languages now into English. <coughs> this is Brenda. That was Yvonne, who was my voice. Now this is Brenda, who's my hands. Um, I wanted to deliver this lecture bilingually. It was important for me to connect with all of my audience. Um, what I often say to people is that uh, when I'm telling stories or talking about me, then um, I often feel more comfortable doing that in British Sign Language because I learned to tell stories in British Sign Language. I learned to have conversations in British Sign Language, but I learned to talk about research in English, so I often feel more comfortable talking about the research that I do in English. So going to Australia and starting my PhD triggered obviously my, research, my interest in doing research on sign language interpreting primarily in, in the first instance, that was what my focus was. And this book um, was actually published out of, out of my PhD, it was my first major publication. And there will actually be a second edition published early next year um, with a slight update to some of the content. But it really did trigger for me a whole new journey, really. I didn't expect to be a professor. I didn't expect to be a researcher. Um, I loved communication. I loved interpreting. I loved sign language. Uh, but through my experience in Australia, 
and doing research, I realised that there was so much potential to understand more about what we do as sign language interpreters, but also about as interpreters and communicators generally by doing more research. So I've had the privilege of collaborating with other people to conduct research and to author textbooks such as this one. So this is a, a textbook which we actually get our students here to use and it's used in many countries throughout the world, which is kind of an introductory textbook for sign language interpreting students. This is the second edition and the third edition will be coming out next year. And when we first wrote it, we called it Sign Language Interpreting Theory and Practice in Australia and New Zealand because we felt that a lot of the dominant texts were coming out of the United States and we felt that we wanted something more local. But since that time we've discovered it's used in Sweden, Finland, Germany, lots of other countries. So the next edition actually is going to have the Australian New Zealand bit taken away from the title because it seems to be more broadly applicable. This is a book that just came out earlier this year where I collaborated with a colleague of mine, Cynthia Roy, who's one of the leading scholars in sign language interpreting research and wrote one of the seminal pieces of uh, research actually in the late 80s, early 90s. And we decided to bring together a collection of seminal texts, um, which we felt really mapped the history of sign language interpreting as a profession, but also <coughs> sign language interpreting research, and tried to put together documents which um, perhaps are more difficult to get hold of these days. And we feature some articles in there which are um, in other languages. We actually have one of our PhD students, Lee, assisted us with translation of a French article, and another one of our students, Marwa, Shami, um, in terms of the German article for us for this. And this is, we're hoping that this will become a bit of a tone for interpreting students and educators to use. So when I uh, kind of decided this is the path for me to follow, I focused my interests on sign language interpreting research and sign language interpreting as a socially situated activity. So what I mean by that is how does it function <coughs> in the real world? What happens? Who does it? Why does it happen that way? So there are projects I've been involved in, either through PhD supervision or other um, opportunities that have looked more at the cognitive processes involved <coughs> in interpreting. So what happens in the brain, like working memory? You know, what do you do when you're working between two languages? And that's kind of interesting, but I'm not really excited by what goes on in somebody's brain. I'm more excited about the impact on people and interaction. In, this, in the social context. And I think that's probably much, very much influenced by my background. In fact, that's my first degree in sociology. So I think I've always been more interested in social interactions <coughs> in society rather than in psychological stuff. So my research is probably concentrated about, around these four main areas in with, with respect to sign language interpreting so far. It might well touch on other areas in the future. And so I'll, I'll just go through a quick kind of snapshot of the various research that I've been involved in. Um, like I said, collaboratively, I've done a lot of uh, research internationally with people across different countries, and also within Australia when I was there, and obviously uh, developing more research opportunities here. I've been here at Harriet Watt now since February 2013. So even though this is my normal lecture, it's uh, two years and nine months down the track. So I've actually made quite a lot of contacts in the uh, in the community and in the university and uh, the research environment here in the UK. So this is an example of uh, workplace interpreting where um, I collaborated again. You can see this is me here. And that's Andy, my husband. And we did a case study of us interpreting for a deaf presenter. And we looked at the strategies, what strategies were being used to ensure that he could get across his message to an audience of people that could hear and couldn't sign, and what he wanted to achieve from a formal seminar presentation. And we documented the kind of collaboration between us as the interpreters and him as the presenter, um, which was actually sort of the first study of its kind at that time. I've also been involved in medical interpreting research. This was a study that I did with a PhD student of mine, George Major, um, where we had simulation of 10 doctor-patient interactions with an interpreter, or 10 different interpreters. Um, a real doctor, a real patient, a deaf patient, and she actually came, we devised a scenario where she uh, was based on a real case for her. She'd 
fractured her ankle and was looking for medication, painkillers. So we designed this role play scenario simulation around mm -hmm. this real case and brought in 10 different interpreters to look at the kinds of strategies that they use uh, to facilitate that. And some of that links in with Claudia's work on medical interpreting as well. If anyone saw Claudia's inaugural lecture last year. This is uh, the start of various legal interpreting projects I've been involved in. This one uh, looks at how providing interpreters in court through video link or video conference actually impacts on the court proceedings. And we tested different scenarios where we had either the interpreter was remote and the deaf person was in court, <laughs> or we had both the deaf person and the interpreter in remote locations being beamed in, if you like, to the courtroom. And we looked at the interpreter uh, in court and the deaf person remote, so we used it, looked at all these different uh, uh, combinations and um, made some recommendations to the New South Wales Department of Justice because they were looking to introduce video conferencing or interpreting into their <coughs> courtrooms and they were concerned about the potential impact the quality of the interpreting services that would be provided. So based on our recommendations, they introduced uh, certain conditions around when it could be used for how long and for what kinds of cases. Another study which I'm still working on at the moment is um, Deaf jurors that participation in many countries, including the UK, are deaf people can't currently serve as jurors. And so this has been a, an ongoing research agenda for about 10 years, originally initiated by the New South Wales Law Reform Commission. They were interested in exploring whether it would be feasible for deaf people to serve as jurors. And there have been various projects I've been involved in to kind of examine this feasibility from different perspectives. So we looked at comprehensibility. So can deaf people sufficiently comprehend legal content in order to make an informed decision as a juror. Um, we looked at perceptions of legal professionals, lawyers, also interpreters as to how feasible they felt it would be. And um, we've also been to the United States where deaf people are permitted to serve as jurors in most states. And we've observed an empowerment process with a deaf person and a sign language interpreter. And we've spoken to judges and lawyers in the United States around their experiences of having deaf people on juries. And this is still ongoing, and I'll come back to this in a minute. This is just a cartoon that I like. Because the interesting thing is, when this project started, and I'll read it out for if anyone can't see it on the live stream, it says, how many of you comprehend the term follicular? This is someone talking to a jury, a lawyer talking to a jury. And everybody on the jury is saying, what does comprehend mean? Because there was an assumption that with deaf people, can they comprehend? It's like, well, most people that aren't deaf, and are, you know, in our case, here in the UK, English native speakers don't necessarily understand everything in a jury anyway. They're on a jury anyway. So there's a lot of assumptions made there about access to information and being able to make informed decisions. The interesting thing is that we got to a point with our research where Pretty much everyone said, yeah, we, we don't see that there's a barrier. Deaf people can serve. There's, there's issues around getting qualified interpreters and making sure that the logistics are set up. But there's no reason why, except that the statutes, what for want of a better term, state that you can't have 13 people in a jury room. You can only have 12. So there have been concerns around having interpreters in the jury room, even though we could say, well, interpreters follow a code of conduct, so a professionally qualified interpreter signs up to a code of conduct, code of ethics, retains confidentiality, impartiality and so on, but the legal profession often struggle with that um, and understanding the role of the interpreter in that context. Which has led on to the current study we're working on at the moment. Um, I went over to Australia last year and we conducted a mock trial, a two-day mock trial, where we had and it's not really a photo, but we had a jury of 11 hearing people, one deaf person, sign language interpreters. We filmed the whole trial, it's based on a real case, and then we filmed the deliberation process. You can see here this photo, um, there were the jurors all around the table. This is the deaf jury here. We have permission, by the way, to show their photo. Um, these are the two interpreters who were working. So we actually had 14 people in the jury room because working conditions normally dictate that. 
anything after 20 minutes, half an hour, you need to have two interrupters changing over because they get fatigued. So we, we filmed the whole thing we, and we interviewed everybody involved and we're still in the process of analysing the data because we have hours and hours of data. But basically what we found is that um, the deaf juror participated. We wanted to look at how, how much they could participate and if it seemed to have any impact on that process of deliberation. And our preliminary findings are showing that the deaf juror participated, the interpreters weren't involved in any way in the discussion. And all the hearing jurors that we interviewed said, it was great, it went really smoothly, there was a lot of turns, everyone got to have their say, we don't think it's a problem. The judge said he didn't feel it was a problem. The, the barristers are the ones who went, yeah, still not sure, but in principle, we think it might work, but we still need to think about it. <clears throat> but we're getting there, you know. And I'm actually on the working group for the UK Ministry of Justice at the moment, where they're looking at access for deaf people to the justice system, right through from you know, police, prisons, in the court, and they're also looking at the issue of deaf jurors. So they're waiting for the results of this research, which might make an impact not just in Australia, but also here in the UK and in other countries too. This is a project I'm involved in at the moment um, with Graham Turner and uh, Rob Skinner, who's our research associate who can be here today, in collaboration with other European countries. It's an EU funded project to look at access to justice for deaf people <coughs> and focuses on their access in police settings. So We've conducted interviews with a whole range of different stakeholders, and we've also um, managed to get a hold of some data. And um, this isn't the picture of the real data that we've got, but it's a simulation to show what, what it looks like, the data that we've got, which is from, which was shared with us through Police Scotland, and I'm working in collaboration with Ursula Bosa, um, to examine the interactions that occur in a police, inter interpreted police interview, um, with a BSL user, deaf BSL user, and an interpreter. And it's really rare to get hold of this data, so I'm very thankful to Ursula and to Police Scotland for giving us the opportunity to examine this data because it will just help us learn more about what happens in that context and how we can then train interpreting students to think about looking in that context in the future. This is another project um, I've been involved in, an EU funded project which looked at video remote interpreting to provide deaf people the opportunity to participate politically. So uh, anybody at the moment can really make contact with your MEP, you can contact any European institution through the telephone, by email. And this project was funded to examine <coughs> whether a video remote interpreting service would be feasible to enable deaf people to contact their MEPs or other uh, European institutions. And we were involved with a consortium of people and Basically what we found was, yes, it's all workable as long as the technology works and the logistics all are in place, then deaf people said they want it, interpreters said they're happy to work in that environment, um, and it's all feasible, but often it's, at the end of the day, it's who's going to pay for it. This is another project I'm still working on with colleagues from Australia. <coughs> we collected 11 hours of data in classrooms, high school classrooms, where there were deaf students in inclusive classrooms, so with hearing students and with interpreters, and examining what we were particularly interested in was the question answer sequences in the classroom. Because if you look at educational research, it shows that questioning is a really important part of the learning process <coughs> for students, and having question answer interactions between teachers and students is really important. And Often there's this kind of illusion of inclusion. So people think that by putting an interpreter in the classroom for a deaf student, that makes it all okay because they've got access. And uh, my colleague Audrey Cameron here has done some similar work here in the UK where what we found was that the deaf students aren't getting access to the questions. And that's not no fault of the interpreters. The interpreters are trying to keep up, they're trying to do the best they can. And what they're often doing is things like summarizing question answer interactions. So the student knows what the topic is and can keep up, but doesn't get the cues, the invitation to participate. Doesn't say, well, by the time they've got the question, it's been answered, another question's been asked, and the student's like this. And the teacher's like, yeah, we already, someone else, you know, Joe Vlogs over here already answered that question five minutes ago, because of the time delay through that process. And so, we, and we didn't want this to, cr to criticise the interpreters, but we wanted to try and have some more evidence to be able to educate teachers on strategies in the classroom. So if you have a deaf student in your classroom with interpreters, think about these things. But also to the interpreters, to get them to think, you know, 
yes, okay, you can summarise, that's a really good strategy to keep up, but what else is being missed out as a result of that? So this is something we're still writing at the moment. So you can see the breadth of work that I have done on sign language interpreting. And as a result of the research that I was doing, I started teaching a little bit in university, became more involved in doing professional development training for sign language interpreters. So I had the privilege of teaching in Fiji and in Kosovo, and I'd given lectures and delivered presentations in Brazil, in America, in China, all over. And this is, for me, it's a, a commitment to translating my research, if you like, into practice, especially in those countries where their professions are still developing, they're still evolving as a profession. Because here in the UK and in Australia, we often complain about the problems that we still experience as a, as a profession, but we're so privileged, and the deaf community is so privileged compared to the experiences in many other countries. As a result of doing my PhD in Australia, one of the reasons I stayed so long was because the university I was at, Macquarie University in Sydney, they had a translation interpreting program, but they didn't have sign language in their program. So I was asked the question, why don't you have sign language? And they said, well, we've not had anyone to teach it because it's that chicken and egg thing. Yeah, so you need someone who's got a master's qualification and ideally a PhD to, to teach at postgraduate level because their program is at postgraduate level. Um, but we don't have a degree of that kind in Australia, so we don't have anyone who has those qualifications. I was like, I'll do it. I have a master's in sign language interpreting from Durham University, and now I have a PhD in linguistics. And they went, okay, set up the program. So um, with some support from people within the department there, we set up the first postgraduate <laughs> program in Australian interpreting in Australia, and it's now also a master's program. It's still running now. And that's... Uh, got me interested in my next kind of line of research, if you like. So applied sign linguistics. And that's, so interpreting could be considered within applied sign linguistics. Applied linguistics is about learning and teaching languages, but also language in use. And so this is actually a book that is coming out at the end of this year, uh, which I've co-authored with a colleague of mine, Lorraine Leeson, who's based at Trinity College. In Ireland, and she's working with us on uh, the Justice Science Project, the Police Interpreting Project as well. And what we've tried to do is take the concepts in applied linguistics and look at how that works in applied sign linguistics. So, where is sign language used? Who is it used by? How is it used? In what contexts? How is it used by language professionals? So, interpreters and translators. How is it learned? How is it taught? And um, so on. So, look out for that. It's coming up in a few months' time. Another sort of applied sign linguistics project I've been involved in is this medical sign bank, where we are collaborating with a colleague of mine who's a linguist sign linguist, Trevor Johnston, who he named the language Australian Sign Language, and we identified that there was a seemed to be a dearth of health-related signs. There was a limited vocabulary in Auslan for describing medical concepts. So we got funding to set up a sort of bottom-up language planning project where we try to engage the deaf community and interpreters to tell us what signs they use for different medical concepts. And it didn't really work that well because people were reluctant to share with us <coughs> through this medium. If we went out into focus groups and we said, tell us a sign for this, they quite happily went through a whole range of things. But if we said, okay, well, can you sign yourself, signing a sign and upload it to the scene, and then we'll refilm it and put it, make it public. We wouldn't make you public, but we'll do a sort of nice citation form. People just didn't do it. So we've actually written about what some of the pitfalls were and recommendations around language planning for sign language users as a result of this project. This is something I'm quite proud of. Um, and you can you probably see where I'm going with some of this, with my research and the impact that it has potentially on the community and informing policy and practice. So I often talk about four Ps with my PhD students and um, it's something I always keep in mind when I'm conducting research and when I'm publishing is how does my research apply to policy, practice for interpreters, pedagogy, and also potentially in provision, so the provision of interpreting services or language services for sign language users predominantly. But I think most of a lot of my research is, is more broadly than that. And so this is a study I was involved in 
looking at deaf people's access to healthcare information. And we interviewed 72 deaf people throughout Australia, and it actually won uh, the best research article by the Royal Australian Royal Australian College of GPs in their uh, medical journal. So I was very proud of this. And we targeted specifically, we wanted this information to get to GPs, so they wouldn't just say, oh, it's okay, we can write notes, or can you lip read me? Um, that they realise the importance of getting interpreters and having translated information. That's another book that I'm um, coming out to you, which looks at how deaf people communicate on an international level in different contexts and different ways. Next milestone, getting there. <coughs> September 6th already, I should, I should speed up. So basically, the theme for my, for my talk is that when things happen in my life, it triggers my research interest. So because I, I was involved in setting up this university program, we started <coughs> teaching more, then I was, it, thought, well, I should study how to teach properly. So I did the Masters in Professional and Higher Education, which then led to my interest in doing pedagogy research. So I've been involved in uh, examining how we can best teach sign language interpreters, but also translating interpreters generally. And this is a book that came out earlier this year, uh, which I co-edited with a colleague of mine in America, looking at how we can use technology in interpreter education, and this <coughs> more broadly as well. Becoming head of the translation and interpreting program at Macquarie meant that I was then responsible for all of the languages there, and that's what led me to coming to hear to Harry of Watt too, because I was really excited that even though my area of expertise is sign language, I was really keen to be in a department which had various languages. It wasn't about deaf stuff, it was actually about language stuff. And recognising that sign languages and spoken languages are on a par. So I've been involved in contributing to various books, encyclopedias, handbooks, that are about translation and interpreting generally, and sometimes talking about sign language interpreting or comparing spoken and sign language interpreting. And I've written a book on search methods in interpreting with a spoken language interpreting research colleague, Sandra Hale, who many of you will know of, um, because we felt it was really important to collaborate on um, this kind of endeavor. So more and more, my, my work now is kind of, I started out with sign language, and now I'm moving towards this idea that yes, sign language is still the bedrock of everything that I do, but I'm actually more interested in looking at how we can examine our interpreting practice and pedagogy, and think about how we can apply that across language communication, intercultural communication, translation, interpreting generally, regardless of the languages that you use. So, I'm becoming more involved in research cooperation with spoken and sign language colleagues. So, up till now, a lot of my research has been with other sign language researchers, but um, I'm now able to co cooperate with other spoken language researchers. So, we, with Sandra Hale, we looked at witness testimony through interpretation and how jurors perceive witnesses when they give their testimony through an interpreter. And so now I'm here. And I'm head of department. Robert managed to persuade me to be the head of department after I've only been in here 18 months, which I am enjoying. Um, and this is my final area of research very quickly. <laughs> I thought it might keep her interested if I put her, a photo of her up there. <laughs> no, she's embarrassed. Um, this is actually the sign for interpreter, and I took a photo of her because she's wearing black, and uh, Brenda's probably the slightly different, but Yvonne is, is playing to the stereotype that sign language is forced to wear black, and um, all black, and that's primarily because um, when you're signing, you don't want any distraction from patterns or too many different colours because it's hard to concentrate. So it's become a bit of a uniform, so we took this picture one day, so it was quite funny, she's like an interpreter. <laughs> but the my interest in language broken research came about because of seeing Tilda actually support my mother, so her grandmother, um, when there was something on television that mum couldn't understand, the, the captions weren't working or weren't very clear. And so Tilda was telling her what was said, and mum said to me, I didn't ask her to do that for me, I, I didn't impose, I didn't ask her to interpret. And I, it piqued my interest as to why, why she did that, because we had this professional sign language interpreting now, 
often people say, well, you know, you shouldn't get your kids to interpret for you. You don't need to because there's professionals. But kids still do it. So this is my next area of research is around language brokering and looking at, um, so brokering is language and cultural mediation, but not in a non-professional sense, rather than professional sign language interpreting sense. So that's the other area of research. And I was going to show you a cute video, but we're running out of time, so I won't show you that. This is um, our examples of research that I've been conducting, starting in Australia and here, working with kids who have deaf parents who can hear, also talking to deaf parents and talking to adults who are interpreters who grew up with deaf parents about how they feel about their experiences growing up interpreting or brokering for their family members, but and then how it's led them to their professional careers now. So the underpinning of all my research is community participation, working with the community and working with the profession, the sign language interpreting profession and also the broader translation interpreting profession to ensure that research is relevant and interesting and has impact. To engage with in the communities, I'm involved in various uh, advisory groups and committees in deaf organisations and interpreting organisations and so on at national, local sort of national international levels to try and raise the profile of what we need as a sign language interpreting profession, but really about meeting the needs of the deaf community worldwide. And I've become quite good at um, knowledge transfer. I didn't know it was called knowledge transfer until uh, quite recently. This is the sort of buzzword in research terms. But thinking about how do we engage the community and remove research from its ivory tower, so making sure that it's accessible. So I regularly do videos. I've got my own YouTube channel, if anyone's interested in subscribing to it. But I regularly do updates about the research that we're doing in sign language so that it's accessible to the deaf community. And we also have a really good blog, Life in Links blog. Katerina Strani is uh, our Life in Links blog coordinator. We has been, done an excellent job in getting contributions from across the whole department, and um, but we use that as an opportunity to showcase what we're doing with our research. And I always make sure that whenever I write a blog, I do a link to a summary of that in, in sign language as well. And there are many opportunities for us in our field to think about how we can disseminate our research in sign language rather than in its written form, which is typical of academia. <coughs> so this is a journal which is published by Gallaudet University, where all the submissions are in sign language, predominantly American sign language, but they're all in sign language. Um, we <coughs> live stream events, which is what we're doing now. This is the community event we did about our social science project a few weeks ago, <coughs> where um, the whole thing was delivered in sign language and was live streamed. So where to from here? I should wrap up because Robert's kind of wanting to send everyone off for a glass of wine, I'm not sure. <laughs> There's lots and lots of opportunities for us, not just here in Scotland, but internationally. Um, you might be aware of the BSL bill that was read in Parliament a few weeks ago and is now going to be shortly an act, which has massive implications for us as a university because Herrick was the only university that has any training for sign language interpreters and any real uh, systematic research on sign language related topics. Um, the fact that the BSL is now recognised on a par with Gaelic um, as a minority community language in Scotland means that there will be a national plan, people will be expected to promote BSL where possible. So there are many opportunities for us here as a university <coughs> and for the community as well, um, more importantly. We have the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities which specifically mentions sign language in five out of the 30 articles and the fact that deaf people have the right to access professional sign language interpreters. So the deaf community have a tool to use to lobby. And we also have other European directives like the directive for the right to access criminal proceedings in your own language, which is about spoken and sign language interpreting. And now sign language is, in America, it's the fourth most <coughs> commonly learned foreign language. And I believe um, there's a survey done recently by an organisation here in the UK, the National Deaf Children's Society. Yes. And they found that all the respondents in their study said that sign language, learning British sign language was, was the second most popular language to be learned above, you know, like French, Spanish and so on. So there are lots of opportunities for us to think about encouraging more people to learn sign language and hopefully get them to come and study with us here. 
and these are other resources that are available. And this, this is my quote from me. <laughs> so I, thought, I was like, I'm going to finish with a quote, and I was like, this is a good quote. <laughs> <laughs> um, given the slow emergence of more collaboration between spoken and sign language interpreting researchers, the future looks bright. The possibilities of increasing collaboration and replication of research across modalities, greater interaction across the interpreting sector, can potentially lead to increased collaboration in terms of service delivery, standards, training, and professional representation. Thank you. <laughs> So I reckon that it's a fine balance always between would you like to go and drink wine or would you like to stay and ask a few questions? I think you'd rather stay and ask a few questions. <laughs> Who'd like to be first? No, I want to wine, see? <laughs> <laughs> and they don't. Just getting warmed up. Please go ahead. Um, I'm interested in how different sign languages are from each other. Um, so if you I don't know, let's say Australian and British Sign Language. How much, if you knew British Sign Language, how much of Australian Sign Language would you be able to understand or American? Um, it's a good question. And like with many uh, spoken languages, you have language families. So often sign languages are related. <coughs> and so British Sign Language and Australian Sign Language, for example, are quite closely related. They're more mutually intelligible than other sign languages. American Sign Language is more closely related to French sign language. And in the deaf world, it's usually as a result of who established the first schools. We see influences, for example, from American Sign Language in parts of Africa, because missionaries, missionaries went there and established the first deaf schools. So there are fat language families, but pretty much every country has its own distinct sign language. Who's next? You, you mentioned the um, British Sign Language Scotland Act uh -huh. and potential implications for institutions like this one. What would you like to see Herrick Watt University do to use sign language interpreters more effectively? To use sign language interpreters more effectively. Um, I think that Herrick Watt could be a hub for everything sign language related. I think that one of the things we don't do here is um, have provision for deaf students. You know, so I think that this could be the place to come if you're a deaf sign language user. Um, we have a very strong team doing sign language research and teaching and interpreting stuff in the Department of Languages. But there are other parts of the university that the deaf community could access if we had sign language interpreting provision. So I, I would see that as a potential future plan. <laughs> <laughs> You had that worked out before. No, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> John. Thank you. Thank you for letting me enjoy the novelty. I was just interested, um, and in a way it was just a little bit on Graham's question. It seems to me that the frame, the frame of reference, quite a lot of your, your earlier research, seems to be looking at it from the point of view of a citizen, mm -hmm. the citizen who's caught up the legal system, the citizen yeah. who might be Europe, the patient yeah. who might be a different doctor. And then we are wondering, what about the barriers for deaf people and members of the profession? But if you're a deaf person, you think kind of, and you want to be a lawyer, or in the context of what I guess, want to be an engineer or a DRSS physicist. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and what are the research opportunities, I guess, which make it easier for those of us who recruit you know, yeah. and train those students? What are the research opportunities? What research agenda might we be setting in our departments, do you think? That, I, mean, I think that's an, an excellent observation and an excellent question because I think you're right that there are many barriers. And if you look in the United States, I think, has, because they, their professional sign language interpreting profession has been much better established for longer than it has here in the UK. So their professional association was established in 1960, 64, I think. So they've had a longer period to establish frameworks, give access to citizens to everyday life experiences, which means that now what you're seeing is more and more deaf people accessing higher education to get trained, becoming qualified as doctors, as lawyers, as physicists, and having sign language interpreters work with them in those contexts. And I think here in the UK, we're starting to see more of that, but we're 
we're probably behind that a little bit because the, we need the sign language interpreting profession to be well established to be able to support the deaf people to get access to the training that they need. So I think that we're definitely on that pathway and we're seeing, I know that there's a deaf person who's a qualified lawyer here in Scotland, he's not practicing primarily because of the barriers to being able to practice, but he is a qualified lawyer. Um, I know that there's a deaf girl studying to be a medical doctor at the moment, but whether that'll ever practice is another question. So there are <coughs> uh, issues there that we would want to tackle head on. I think the, the first step is making sure that deaf people can get access to kind of the basic provisions that we would expect on a daily basis as a, a person, as a citizen, before we then think about, okay, how can we extend that to the cost of things, but maybe we could talk some more about professional, other potential research agendas that would be <coughs> a lot of potential there, absolutely. Um, as BSL students within the University Department, there's possibly a feeling of being in a slightly different camp from the spoken language students. Do you think that's a natural or a, an ongoing problem that, that will always be faced? I just think we could see a day where it would be no different from the fact that Chinese and Arabic has a list alphabet um, to respond to the other languages that are being taught. Um, one of the reasons I love being at Harriet One, I like to be at Macquarie, is because of that, uh, that what I see as an equity between sign and spoken languages and recognising they're all just languages. But I recognise there is a slight difference. And I think primarily it's about where, as sign language interpreters, we work. So in the program that we have here, a lot of our students, we're trained to work as conference interpreters. We also train them to work as liaison interpreters, so in the public sector. But sign language interpreters work primarily in the public sector. And I think that's where there's probably a slight differential. But ultimately, I would say that we should all be considering the spoken and sign language interpreters the same way. And the thing is, with, with BSL at Heriot Watt, it's actually been around at Heriot Watt for a very long time. But the undergraduate four year program, you're, I think you're in the first year, right? So you're our fourth first year group. Okay, so the fourth years up at the back, who are our first cohort, will be graduating next year. It's been a massive learning curve, I think. I came to the program and uh, Svenja and Gary had already worked on setting up this program, so I was lucky enough to join and go, woohoo, I just get to ride on their coattails. Um, but we've all got a lot to learn, I think, about what needs to be tweaked and how we can work more synergistically across the languages in the department. No, I should know better than to intervene on the subject. I really don't know anything about. <laughs> Let me have a go. Anyway, I wonder how much of your question is because of the intrinsic nature of the subject, or how much of it is simply that something which is intrinsic to the academic world which is the small differences between specialist subjects very often get exaggerated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how many chemists in the audience? Yeah. It looks like we probably haven't. Oh, we have. Oh, yes, we have. Um, yes, I wonder yes. if the difference between, um, I wonder whether the difference between the spoken languages and the sign languages would be considered any more acute than the difference uh, between as risk it, organic chemistry and physical chemistry in terms of the cultural approach. I'm exaggerating to make the point, but I hope you remember something I said right at the beginning of this lecture, which was the purpose of this university has always been the contributions it makes to society, and there are fewer and fewer really important societal problems which comfortably live inside the remit of a single academic tribe. I think John I knew I shouldn't have interviewed. <laughs> <laughs> Any further questions? I really enjoyed your presentation, Jemima, thank you. And I think it's been a great opportunity for you, you know, you came into interpreting without formal training, you said, you know, but now you've done that, that training, gone the academic route. Um, and it's fascinating to see, you know, I think that there's a lot of people who do take the academic route to interpreting. There are vocational routes to interpreting. So I suppose my question is, you know, what would you say 
are the risks of interpreting without that academic route. If you don't have that theory, you know, if you maybe just have the skills but without that academic training, do you see there's any risks there? I'll respond in the SL2. Just like you get seated. <coughs> That's a good question. You know, as I said earlier, um, and today earlier on I gave another seminar to PhD students and that was one thing I did talk about and um, that you know even if you grow up as a bilingual and you use English out with the home and ESL at home then interpreting skills are not just about being bilingual so there's additional skills you need to be an interpreter you know I feel I'm a good interpreter because of my training because I've had to think about language, how language is used, how it's used in different genres and different areas, and how I would then translate that into sign language. So it doesn't mean that just because my mum signs like that and I use that at home, I would always interpret that way. So the theory, I think, improved my accuracy and my ability to interpret in all these different situations. So I think bilingualism is one, one skill, and bilingualism to the level of being able to interpret is another skill. And I think that training absolutely builds on that and develops that skill. And I think that to be a good interpreter, you need that additional skill of interpreting. But thank you for your question. I think that <coughs> the wine beckons. But you're going to stick around, aren't you? Uh, and I'm sure there'll be an opportunity for some further informal discussion. But before we part, I have a feeling Robert has a word or two to say. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it, uh, it's my duty to keep you just one or two moments longer before you get to those wine and cafes that you will have had twice now. We started this evening with Julie interfacing <coughs> that physicists speak in incomprehensible symbols, and then we've had, I think, a really fascinating overview of Jemina's research <coughs> journey and her personal journey. It's quite interesting that she was clear at the beginning that ESL or OSLAN or any of the other sign languages are not just English on the hand, they are a language in themselves. I think my fellow academic colleagues from the school and from the wider university will be very worried that in any future inaugural lecture there's the obligation to have a chronological sequence of <laughs> fashionable photos of various ages and stages. <laughs> That's not a blanket frame, but thank you for seeing it. <laughs> um, I thought that the fact that Jemina was considerate enough as one interpretation or brave enough as another interpretation to deliver her seminar bilingually was a really powerful de demonstration for those of us in the audience that are not bilingual or trilingual, let alone going across the spoken word in any of its genres and the sound word. And I got a distinct impression, much richer than I've had before, I have to say, and I worked with Jemina for a few years, of quite how powerfully expressive and different one mode of delivery can be from the other. I think it has been a really fascinating insight into the process and structure and the professionalization of interpreting. And there are others of us in the school who are interested in the professionalization of other disciplines in the same way that accounting or engineering or physics develops its own professional status and just interpreting achieve the same thing. I would hope over the course of this evening that you've had a genuine sense if you're new to the university that the School of Management of Languages and the wider university are rightly very proud of what the DSL team have done in recent years and are in the process of achieving and are putting in place. I think it's been a fascinating I will close with one um, final observation that there probably are several new signs from Australia uh, after the fracas <laughs> <laughs> but none of them are probably appropriate for all country, both your parents and your daughter. Uh, so could I ask you to thank Jemina in the usual way for her contribution? Thank you. So, some wine and stuff outside.